hopefully we'll have some audience. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Nā mihi mahana kia koutou katoa. Welcome and thanks for joining us for our A Lot on Our Plates expert panel. This is brought to you by AF8 and East Coast Lab with the kind support of EQC. My name is Kate Borson and I work for East Coast Life at the Boundary, a program that makes it easy and exciting to learn more about natural hazards and how they affect us along the East Coast. Kia ora, my name is Alice and I'm the program leader for AF8, which stands for Alpine Fault Magnitude 8. And we bring science, civil defence and communities together so that we can be better prepared for the next Alpine Fault earthquake. Over the last few weeks, we've been asking you to submit your questions that we can put to our expert panel on your behalf. Thanks to everyone who has sent one in. We've had a lot of questions and we're going to try and get through as many as we can um, within the next hour. Our sincere apologies if we don't get to your question tonight. We've done our best to cover all the topics um, we've received interest on, but we may not get through everything in the time we have available. We'll follow up with the questions we don't get to over the next few days, so please do get in contact if you'd like further information or if you have a follow-up question. The best way to do that would be to send us a message on our Facebook pages. Um, and one last housekeeping note, most of us are all safe in our own homes this evening, so I don't think I need to tell you where find the emergency exit or the bathroom. However, if you feel an earthquake during this talk, the best thing to do is to drop, cover and hold where you are until the, shake, until the shaking stops. If that shaking feels long or strong and you're near the coast, get gone and evacuate once the shaking has stopped. Okay, I'm gonna briefly introduce our panel, then Kate will kick things off with the first question. Tonight we are joined by Dr. Caroline Holden, who's a senior scientist at GNS Science and the leader of Wellington's It's Our Fault program. Caroline is a seismologist who has been involved in both the development of the AF8 hazard scenario and the Hikurangi response planning project. We also have Dr. Caroline Orcheston, who is a science lead for AF8. She is the deputy director of the Center of Sustainability at the University of Otago. She's also the co-leader of Resilience to Nature's Challenges rural program and a member of the Plate Core leadership team. Also with us tonight, we have Dr. Kate Clark, who's a senior scientist at GNS Science. Kate is an earthquake geologist with a focus on the geological records of earthquakes and tsunami. Her research spans both, both the Alpine Fault and the Hikurangi subduction zone. Uh, coming with us, coming, zooming in from Auckland, we have Le Associate Professor Liam Witherspoon. Uh, he is an Associate Professor in Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Auckland. He is a fellow of the New Zealand Society for Earthquake Engineering, a member of the Quake Corps leadership team, and the co-leader of the Resilience to Nature's Challenges Built Environment Program. Uh, with us in Wellington, we have Dr. Rob Langridge. He is a senior scientist at GNS Science. Rob is an earthquake geologist with a focus on earthquake history and the seismic hazard of faults. His work has largely been focused on the Alpine Hope and Wellington faults, and more recently, he's been involved in the science response to the Kaikoura earthquake. Uh, with us from Christchurch, we have Professor Tom Wilson. Tom is a Professor of Disaster Risk and Resilience at the University of Canterbury. He's the co-leader of Resilience to Nature's Challenges Rural Program, along with Caroline, and is also one of our science leaders for AF8. And last but not least, we have Dr. William Power, who is a Senior Geophysicist at GNS Science. William is a tsunami modeler and has helped develop the science scenario for the Hikurangi Response Planning Project and more recently, he has been working on tsunami evacuation modeling. You're on mute, Kate. Thanks, Caroline. <laughs> so we're going to start by asking some of the questions that people have submitted over the last few weeks. But if you have a question, just post it in the comments below and we'll try to get to as many of these questions as we can. Like Alice said, we'll follow up with the questions we don't get to over the next few days. So please do get in contact if you'd like further information or if you have a follow-up question. And the best way to do that would be to send us a message via our Facebook page. So our first question tonight um, is one from Tracy and Phil. So though um, Tracy and Phil have both asked questions about the Australian Pacific plates and how they meet. So Tracy asked, is one plate sliding in 
under the other, which one is going up and which one is going down. And Phil asked, if the Indo-Australian plate is subducting under the Pacific plate, um, how is that all interacting? So Rob, you're probably the best one um, to answer this question. How do the two plates meet across the entire plate boundary? So from the Kermadec Trench in the north to the Pusica Trench in the south. Sure thing. Kia ora, Phil and Tracy. Yeah, so um, what's interesting about Zealandia, I guess, um, amongst other plate boundaries around the world is that we have a mixture of both oceanic crust in our environment and continental crust. And the continental crust is what we live on, more or less makes up the two main islands. Um, and so as we progress across New Zealand from the north to the south, we have margins where oceanic crust is subducting underneath um, other oceanic crust. I'm talking about north of East Cape. But as that subduction front uh, propagates into more continental crust environments, like offshore of the East and North Island and eventually to the South Island, we have continental crust abutting up to continental crust. And that results um, not in regular subduction, but in sort of stuffed up subduction. Um, and, and ultimately, we have translation in the south line of one plate alongside another along the Alpine Fault. And that does sort of a weird thing at the southern end, it flips over and does the opposite. So the southern end of the New Zealand system, um, the Australian plate starts subducting underneath the continental crust of the Pacific plate. It's just kind of a long answer, but how's that? That's great. Thank you, Rob. It's a long plate boundary, isn't it? Um, so the next question we have is from Hamish, and it sounds like one for a seismologist. Uh, Hamish wants to know, should the fault rupture, how do the shock waves dissipate? Do they just get weaker from a distant point of view, distance point of view? Or does it make a difference if you live on the side of a hill or near a mountain? Does that, would that lessen the shock? So, Caroline, how do seismic waves behave and what impact what impacts the different levels of shaking when we feel a fault rupture? Um, kia ora, Hamish. Well, there's a few ingredients that control the strength of ground shaking from an earthquake. And actually, so one part of the ingredient is related to the source, the earthquake itself. So the closer you are to the earthquake epicenter, the stronger the ground shaking will be. That's one obvious fact. But actually, there's some like external um, ingredients that will also control how strong the ground shaking is. And just as you mentioned, some of them are hills and basins. And so the big picture is the geology will control how strong the ground shaking is, because if you have a very, very hot crust, it will attenuate the waves that, that, um, that carry the strength of the ground shaking. But also the local geology. So if you have hills or mountains or local basins, these will control the amplify or deamplify some parts of the seismic, of the shaking of the seismic waves. Now, the last part of the ingredients is also the building that you're sitting in. So depending on the, the size of the building, the structures, so a, a single story structure or really tall 20, like for New Zealand, 20 story building, um, you're going to feel the earthquake very differently. Um, so in a short answer, yes, if you're near a hill or on a mountain, you, can, you might be, have some amplification due to the topography, uh, but also um, because of the, the strength of the earthquake itself. Thanks, Caroline. Um, so Ben has asked a question, which I think is quite an interesting question. He has asked, which is worse, worse an AF, an Alpine fault event or a hickory subduction zone um, event. So Kate, um, would you be able to answer that question? <laughs> yeah, so um, typical scientist answer, it depends. Um, it depends on where you are and how you're measuring sort of the impact of the earthquake. So by almost all measures, if you're on the west coast of the South Island in an Alpine fault earthquake, you would be far worse affected by an Alpine fault earthquake than a Hickering subduction zone earthquake. Um, the opposite is true. If you're in the North Island, particularly anywhere along the East Coast, a Hickering subduction zone earthquake is going to be significantly worse for you. Um, and kind of the bigger picture, if you're measuring it by impact, well, size of earthquake, firstly, the Alpine fault is about 500 kilometers long. 
Um, the Hikurangi subduction zone is quite a bit longer. It's about 700 kilometers long. So it has the potential to have much larger earthquakes. Um, and earthquakes on the Hikurangi subduction zone, can, so they can affect a much larger area and there's significantly more population in the North Island that would feel that earthquake. And the Hikurangi subduction zone is also very likely to trigger a large tsunami as well. So by the kind of measure of how many people would be affected and sort of secondary effects um, like tsunami, a Hikurangi subduction zone is probably going to be much worse. Um, and in terms of just because of the number of people and the infrastructure in the North Island, if you look at it in terms of economic impact, a um, Hikurangi subduction zone is also probably going to be um, worse than an Alpine Fault earthquake. Yeah. Well, that's really interesting. Thanks, Kate. Um, here's a great question from Kelly, and I'm going to put this to Caroline and Tom, perhaps. Are we as prepared as we could be for a major earthquake event in New Zealand? Tom, um, shall I have the first stab and then pass over? Great. Well, firstly, kia ora koutou everyone and thanks for joining us tonight. And I really want to thank Kate and Alice for organising this event. It's really awesome for us to be able to take part in something like this and have, have a face to face with people who are interested to know more about this stuff. So. It's a great question, and I suppose, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of like how long is a piece of string in terms of how prepared we need to, to be. Um, I think it's fair to say that over the last 10 years, we've become a lot better prepared for a whole range of natural um, event, natural disasters, I suppose, mainly because of our experience of the Canterbury earthquake sequence. So prior to that, we'd had... In 1987, the Edgecombe earthquake, prior to that, it was back in 1968, our, our, our next most notable earthquake. And so several decades had gone by without a major urban earthquake in New Zealand. And so it's fair to say that we were quite complacent as a nation when it comes to earthquake preparedness. So after 2010, of course, we had real experience of this and it really brought into the limelight the need for us to get better prepared for earthquakes. And so a whole host of initiatives have really kicked off in terms of um, reducing our disaster risk and building our response capability for future events. And actually, this is where AF8 and EC Lab really came from. We were given funding to support this kind of work. And um, over the last five years, from AF8's perspective, we've worked closely with emergency managers and all of the partner agencies involved in responding to a disaster. Um, to really uh, improve the way that we would work and coordinate as a team to deal with something like this. And so um, as it's, I think there's always more we can do as individuals in our own homes to get better prepared, but at a, a sort of a high level, at a societal level, a lot of work's going on uh, to build our collective resilience to some, some future events. Um, and, but of course, there's always more we can do. So Tom, anything to add? <laughs> Oh, that, was, that was fabulous, Caroline. And, and I just wanted to um, echo what you've said about Kate and Alice. Thank you so much for, for organising this fantastic event. Um, I guess some perspectives that, that are worth um, considering from the last 10 years, as, as Caroline um, mentioned, is uh, th there's always more that we can be doing. And um, I guess, you know, living here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, it's a fact of life that we're going to have earthquakes. It's, it's part of the special part of, of, of where we live in the world. So being prepared for these, these things is, um, being, is uh, part of being a New Zealander. Um, and I, I guess some of the big challenges that we face as a society is thinking about you know, earthquake prone buildings. How do we ensure that they are remediated to a point that they're, they're safe or that we, we think they'll be as safe as possible? without um, causing undue harm and, and challenges for, for owners and, and occupiers. And, and there's some really challenging aspects there. And at a household level, knowing what, what can we do to make sure that our, our, our family or whanau are, are safe, you know, making sure our chimneys are well secured, hot water cylinders um, well secured. Um, some of the, the um, I'm just looking at my bookshelf, which we've just moved into a new house in, here in Christchurch. And the first thing we did was secure all the big heavy furniture to the, to the walls because we've, we've had some tough lessons over the last uh, 10 years. So it's things like that, which you know, we can all do our part. And the more that we all pull together, um, the better off we'll be as a, as a society. Cool. And um, so cool to hear, Tom, that you've done your fix fast, don't forget, as well. Um, so our next question is um, related to tsunami speed and evacuation time. So um, quite a few questions, um, well, people were interested in this. So we've got a question from Phil. Um, Phil has asked about how quickly tsunami wave travels. 
he and Susie who live in Napier would like to know how much time do they have to evacuate um, following an earthquake along the Hickory subduction zone. Um, Sandra's also asked a kind of similar question. So um, Sandra would like to know if a tsunami, um, how long would it take for a tsunami to reach Palmerston North or Foxton? Um, and Hazel and Tanya um, from Christchurch want to know if there's a tsunami, how far inland um, do we need to go? So William, you're the, um, the tsunami expert that we've got online tonight. So William, can you tell us a bit more about tsunami speed and evacuation times, please? Yep, certainly. Hello, everybody. Um, as far as the speed that a tsunami travels at, it's a function of how deep the water is. Um, essentially, the speed is proportional to the square root of the water depth. So when you're in the really deep ocean and it's about four kilometers deep, uh, then the tsunami can travel at about 700 kilometers an hour, so the speed of a jet aircraft. But as it comes into shallower water, it slows down. So in about 100 meters depth of water, the tsunami would be traveling at about 110 kilometers an hour, so the speed of a fast car. And by the time you get to 10 meters water depth, it'd be traveling at about 35 kilometers per hour. So a slow moving car or very fast running person. Um, so then the question of how long does the tsunami take to, to reach the coast becomes uh, down to two factors. One is where is the tsunami exactly generated? So the tsunami is generated by movement of the seabed. So how close to the coast is that movement taking place? And what is the shape of the seabed between where the tsunami is generated and the, and the coast that you're, that you're at? Um, so it's a little bit tricky to give general answers to this because we often don't really know in advance how the pattern of movement of the seabed is, is exactly going to be. So I try and answer your question using the example that we looked at for the Hikarangi response plan. So this was a magnitude 8.9 Hikarangi subduction zone earthquake. And when we modeled that propagating to Napier, we found that um, the peak of the first wave arrived about 30 to 50 minutes after the earthquake. So that's varying depending exactly where you are along the Napier coastline. Um, for Gisborne, we found that a bit less. So the equivalent was about 20 to 40 minutes. Um, so if you're thinking, so for, let's focus on, on Napier for now, you've got about, if you aim for half an hour, that's probably a pretty good target for trying to get to safety. I would say though, you know, just get ready and go as soon as you safely can, because it could take you longer to get to safety than you think, it could be crowded. Um, if you get there early, that's good. You can move away beyond the evacuation line and leave space for the people who are behind you. Uh, a few words of caution. So sometimes if you're right down by the coast, there may be some earlier waves. So if you're right down on the beach or around the river estuary, it's a good idea to, to move to, to, to move out of those areas pretty quickly. Um, so that's the first question. If I go to the second question, which is about um, Palmerston North and Foxton. So that one, well, I don't think there's any risk of a tsunami reaching Palmerston North, the main city itself. That's too far inland. Foxton, we'd have to split that between talking about Foxton itself and Foxton Beach. So Foxton, the main town, is far enough from, from the coast that uh, it's the, the, com the residential and commercial parts of town are outside of the tsunami evacuation zone. Um, what you do have to be careful of is tsunamis can be quite good at traveling up rivers. So you could have a wave going up the Manawatu River. So I would, you know, um, I think you need to keep away from the Manawatu River, its floodplains and the tributary of the Manawatu River that goes around through to near to Foxton. So as long as you stay away from the river, I think you're okay in Foxton. Uh, Foxton Beach is a different story because that's right, right by the coast and quite low lying in places. So Foxton Beach is definitely is within the tsunami evacuation zone. And that's definitely a place where you feel the long or strong earthquake, um, you want to get gone quickly. Um, around times, it's a little difficult. We don't have any detailed modeling. 
um, some of the faults offshore of the Foxton Beach area are relatively close. So although those particular faults are relatively low activity, so relatively low chance that you get a tsunami from them, um, but they are close. So there's a small chance it could arrive you know, within a few minutes. So do go quickly as a precaution, um, but that's mostly precautionary. Um, so what's the next question was about Christchurch. Shall I go on to that one, Kate? Yeah, yes, please, William. So there's a question about how far inland should you go in Christchurch to avoid tsunamis? And the answer there is it is very variable. And the best thing really is to go to look at the Christchurch City Council website. And if you search for Christchurch tsunami evacuation maps, you'll see how much variation there is. So as, as I mentioned about Foxton, tsunamis can travel quite a long way up rivers. So along the Avon and Heathcote uh, rivers, you know, you can get several kilometers from the coast and you're still in the tsunami evacuation zone. Whereas if you're in one of the hilly suburbs on the south side of the harbor, the tsunami might only go you know, 100 meters or so. So it's very variable and best to look at the council tsunami evacuation maps. Um, I think there was one other question about um, someone in Bishopsdale in Christchurch. I think Bishopsdale is, is quite a long way from the coast. I don't believe there's any tsunami risk to Bishopsdale. Brilliant. Thanks, William. Uh, just keeping on that topic of tsunami, Peter um, has asked us if we know of any kōrero around tsunami before Pākehā arrived in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Kate Clark, would you like to be able to tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, um, so there is a lot of information and in kōrero about tsunami um, from before Pākehā arrival in New Zealand, and it's actually... Um, a really useful and important record for understanding tsunami hazard. And it's also something that um, several people sort of specialize in, in researching. So with permission of various iwi around the country, they, they investigate these records and sort of interpret them in terms of what they can tell us about tsunami impacts around New Zealand. Um, so they take different forms as well. Some, some recollections are very um, descriptive sort of um, descriptive descriptions of waves um, that arrive at the coast. Others take the form of sort of parako. Um, they can be in waiata. It can describe things ranging from um, waves arriving at the coast to uh, tanifa coming from the sea and sweeping people away. Um, yeah, and they also, the other interesting thing is that there's different um, sort of narratives from all around New Zealand. So um, I can think of some really important ones from Southland, different stories from up at Durville Island, uh, Wellington, Chatham Islands. Um, yeah, so we, we do see these um, pre-European narratives about tsunamis um, all around New Zealand. Cool, thank you, Kate. So while we know the Hikarangi subduction zone is definitely capable of causing a tsunami, um, Kelly would like to know, can the Alpine Fault cause tsunami events? So William, perhaps you could answer that, that one. Um, and Caroline or Tom, you might like to talk about it a little bit in terms of the AF8 scenario. Uh, yes. So the, the Alpine Fault earthquake, um, well, We've, we're already, we've mentioned that in usually it's the movement of the seabed that, that causes a tsunami. So with the Alpine fault, the fault is on land and the movement on the fault is horizontal, mostly horizontal. So there's not a lot of vertical movement. So Alpine fault earthquake is unlikely to directly cause a tsunami. However, there are a few other things we should be careful about. There's a phenomenon called seishing. So if you have a lake or a fjord or a harbor, and that gets moved horizontally backwards and forwards by the earthquake shaking, that can produce uh, waves. And that was, free, that was much noted in 1855 in Wellington Harbor where the seishing effect um, flooded some of the quaysides. So that's definitely something that could happen, for instance, in some of the high country lakes in an alpine fault scenario. Um, Another way that an alpine fault 
earthquake could indirectly cause tsunamis is by causing landsliding. So we've seen, for instance, in the Kaikoura earthquake, all the landslides that were caused by the shaking in that event. And if some of those landslides end up in water bodies, that can cause um, localized tsunamis. Um, there's a historical example from 1929 with a Buller earthquake that caused a slump on the, on the coast, on the west coast. Um, and uh, 20 kilometers away at Karamea, there was a I mean, a tsunami recorded at about two and a half meters high. So that slump produced a tsunami that spread along that coast. So that kind of effect um, can indirectly cause a tsunami. Um, the other thing to be aware of is that, I mean, we, we can see in, with the Kaikoura earthquake that we had many different faults involved. So we tend to assume that the Alpine fault, maybe, maybe this is not, be interested in other people's uh, thoughts on how good an assumption this is, but the Alpine fault on its own may not directly produce deformation of the seabed, but there are other faults nearby, for instance, off the west coast or, that are offshore that can produce tsunamis. So could we be definitely sure that those faults would not be rupturing at the same time as the Alpine fault? Um, I think that's an open question. So there's a few good reasons for the possibility of tsunami waves or seishing waves after an alpine fault earthquake, but not directly caused by the movement on the alpine fault itself. Mm. Fantastic answer, William. And I don't have much more to add apart from to say that if anyone happens to be around the Southern Alps when this earthquake happens, definitely move away from lake bodies and, and rivers for that reason, because um, you just never know if there might've been a rock fall up the lake that you're not aware of that might send a wave down the lake, for example, into Queenstown um, or, or that sashing effect, um, that sloshing around of the water around the margin of lakes. Um, so yeah, th great answer. Thanks, William. Great, thank you guys. Um, we have a question from Ruth. Ruth would like to know what links the Alpine Fault to the North Island. Uh, she wonders if it's the fault lines around Seddon. Rob, I wondered if you could tell us what's going on in the Upper South Island, Central New Zealand area, please. Sure thing, yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, dominating the South Island plate boundary, I guess, is that Alpine Fault that we've been talking about and actually runs offshore as well. To the south of um, to the south of Fiordland, um, and as it runs up the South Island from southwest to northeast, it gets about halfway up the island, and then the plate boundary changes a bit, and it kind of spreads out towards Kaikoura and Blenheim, and it's a it's a part of the plate boundary that we call the Marlborough Fault System. So, the um, the Alpine Fault has slip rates. Um, geological slip rates of about three centimetres per year. So that's the strain accumulating across it. And that three centimetres per year is spread out amongst a number of faults. We call these the Hope Fault, the Clarence Fault, the Awatere Fault, and the Wairo Fault. And these are the four main faults that sort of head from, from uh, around Hokitika across to Kaikoura, that's the Hope Fault. Um, the Clarence Fault is north of that, the Awatere Fault is north of that, and the Wairo Fault is essentially the extension of the Alpine Fault all the way up to Cook Strait. And the system evolves more and, and some of them change name and they change direction a bit and, and there, some of them were involved of course in the Kaikoura earthquake in 2016. So, so we go from a pretty simple kind of plate boundary in the south to a distributed or complex plate boundary in Marlborough. And then from there, um, these faults go across Cook Strait. There's some pretty interesting changes in the system there. And then it evolves to the northeast into the Hikarangi subduction margin. Yeah. Thanks, Rob. That's really, really interesting. So our next question is Rachel from Darfield, and she would like to know where the next rupture of the Alpine Fault is most likely to start. So definitely have our fingers crossed that it doesn't happen anytime soon. Um, but Caroline, um, could you explain why most often um, AF8 talks about the Alpine Fault earthquake beginning at the southern end? Yeah, 
Yeah, sure. Yeah. And I guess the first thing to say is that we don't know exactly when the Alpine fault, where the Alpine fault epicenter will be. Um, you, you might have seen the simulations that are on YouTube with that epicenter um, showing down in, in the Milford Sound kind of area and the seismic energy pushing up towards the northeast. So just to give you a bit of context around that, um, when we started planning the AF8 scenario, we began with three different ones. The first one with, this, with the epicenter around Milford, the second up in the northern part of the Alpine Fault, which uh, resulted in more of the seismic energy pushing down towards the, the southwest. And the third scenario beginning uh, on the central part of the Alpine Fault around the glaciers and the seismic energy going out in two different directions. Um, we wanted to move forward with one scenario for the, the purposes of planning for AF8. And so the, the consensus amongst the science team was that the south to north rupture, uh, in other words, that, that Milford Sound epicenter was the most scientifically credible as well as the fact that it sort of presented the greatest challenge to civil defence and those partner agencies in terms of planning for a future event. And the reason for that is because that, that southern epicentre pushes the energy up to the northeast, um, where most of the population of the South Island lives, where the greatest uh, sort of proportion of our highway network would be affected. So this would sort of pre present almost sort of a worst case alpine fault scenario. And so that's why we went with the south to north uh, scenario for this um, planning, the purposes of this planning. Yeah, uh, Rob, you might want to add to that in terms of the science and the evidence around that. Oh, I guess that's a pretty good answer. Um, I'd say in very simple terms, like I was saying before, the, the southern part of the Alpine Fault is quite simple. Um, it's a simple plate boundary. And as it progresses to the northeast, it, becomes, it merges into that Marlborough Fault system. And so the idea was that perhaps the, um, the epicenter would be in the southwest and progress from something simple towards something more complicated where the earthquake might be arrested in that area. Great, thank you both for that. Almost muted myself again. Uh, Liam, here's a question for our engineering expert from Sarah. Uh, Sarah would like to know how long uh, are we expecting the power to be out in the South Island after an Alpine fault earthquake? Uh, and she's interested in uh, restarts and black starts and also how long should we prepare to be without power? She says that she lives just north of Christchurch. Great, uh, thanks for that question. So I guess along with a lot of other questions that have been answered, again, I'll use the word, it depends, a couple of words, it depends. So it definitely depends on where you are on the South Island and as you'd expect, based on the intensity of shaking that that's going to likely result in a variability in, this, in the, the impacts it's going to have for your electricity network. Uh, so there may be very little disruption in some areas. There may be a couple of days and that like likely to ramp up to maybe over a month in some of the, the areas like the West Coast has been mentioned before that there may be uh, a month or more of, of disruption to some areas because of the damage to that uh, electricity network. Um, I guess in, in the, the location you are just north of um, Christchurch that maybe that's in the lower end of the scale in terms of that uh, level of disruption um, and I guess that's just uh, related to the the one one thing there that's related to is the intensity of the shaking is less in that location as it are in some of the other parts uh, across the South Island. Um, it's not just sort of the the shaking in one level because it's a network it's how that then propagates out throughout the networks and what that means to to that outage so I guess um, there is a lot of work with understanding um, what the damage might be to different components of, of those networks. Uh, and you, you actually see sort of power poles, often they perform pretty well at high levels of shaking, but if you link in things like landslides and liquefaction, that that really has an impact um, on how that's gonna perform if they're gonna stay standing up and, and continue to allow that power to trans transmit through. Um, uh, and then also, I guess, another key aspect of that is how do you access those for repair? So there's a lot of reliance of the electricity network on the road network to try to access and allow that to build forward. And there's work and, a, and an understanding of those lifeline networks that they need to work together to understand how to progressively bring things back online. And again, that's very much a factor of where is the damage, uh, where are the people, how much people there are to try to allow that to occur. Um, I'll sort of focus in on the question around the hydro plants because that's an interesting one. So um, 
yeah, it very, again, it very much depends what's the level of shaking at those different locations. And, and um, that, that spans from, is it the level of shaking that they need to shut things down to just check for any damage? Is it severe enough? There is going to be damage developed. Um, you know, that's a process that we'll go through and that will depend on the, the, the type of alpine fault event that occurs and where that energy is really pushing out from that fault to the different areas is going to depend on what that sort of damage will be. Um, but if they do start shut down, I guess the key thing there is that doesn't immediately mean that if the entire network's out of power. Um, so really the electricity network is all about balance. So if you reduce down the generation in one location, then you need to balance that loss of generation with the demand to keep that in line. So um, they may shut down plants together or progressively shut ones down and bring them back up to try to ensure that across that balance, there's power supplied as best as possible as they can um, following that event. So, um, and that there's a lot of work that's been done to try to understand what that might be. Um, there was the question about black start. The black start would only need to occur if there's a total loss of, of, the, of the network across the, uh, the island. And that's sort of quite a very unlikely thing to occur. Um, so because they're allowed to have that balance, they'll be doing whatever they can to keep that network going. And it's only really if you lose everything that they will have a slow re-energization, but um, it's very, very, very unlikely that that would occur. Well, it sounds like you might be without power for a wee while. So Tom, you were talking earlier about having secured your bookcases. Have you done anything at home to kind of prepare for not having power? Um, I have actually. So we've got a big gas supply for our barbecue and, and a whole bunch of charcoal because my wife loves a good charcoal barbecue. Um, so the idea is that we can have an alternate heat source so that if it, an event happens in winter when, when it's cold, um, that we can, we can still be warm. And uh, I've just got a little baby, so we need to make sure that she's, she's okay. Um, and I, you know, I guess it's, it's the same for many places across New Zealand. I grew up on a farm in, in the central part of Canterbury, so we'd often lose power from snowfall or, or whatever. Um, so it's a, about having those, that redundancy um, available and in place. And the other big thing that we've done is, you know, lots of food supplies where um, it's pretty easy to heat up and um, we've got some options there. So uh, many people are, will have come through the, the, the lockdown with the pandemic with um, thinking around um, how did they feed themselves and, and thinking about access to food and, and that type of thing. So it's, it's a great opportunity to just have a wee think around how is my household prepared and, and what are some of the options that I've got if, if, um, if something weird happens. Oh, thank you, Tom. Um, so another um, thing that's obviously really important to have is water. Um, so we have a question here from Jay, and she'd um, like to know, can aquifers be damaged in a bad earthquake? So Caroline, would you tell us a little bit about how aquifers can be impacted by earthquakes? Well, it's, this is going to be unusual, but I'm going to have a straight answer. Yes. They can be damaged by bad earthquakes and actually they can be damaged at quite large distances. Uh, we've observed damaged aquifer up to a thousand um, kilometers. Now it's an um, interesting question because we there's just been a recent study that's just been published on a decade of um, aquifer response from earthquakes in New Zealand and um, and that study is looking at what actually causes the damage to those aquifers and they're looking at is it the rock strength so is it the depth of the aquifer or is it the strength of the ground shaking and so that study has um uh, from looking at these decades of earthquakes from new zealand they, they've concluded that it's actually it's the strength of the ground shaking that that creates the damage to the aquifer now the good news is there's also another study that's looking at the healing phase of those aquifers. So some of them can actually take nine months to up to a year to actually come back to the state that they were before um, the shaking from, the, from that earthquake. So there's a study that's ongoing at the moment in the Wellington region, and it's looking at the response of aquifers uh, from, the, um, from, from local earthquakes in the Wellington regions. So it's using seismic data to look at the strengths of rocks and how they correlate with the response of aquifers in the Wellington region. That's great. Thanks so much, Caroline. Um, we've also had a few questions related specifically to the Canterbury earthquakes. Uh, these come from Matt, Mel and Maria. 
So Matt lives in Christchurch Eastern Suburbs and would like to know if the impacts of an Alpine Fault earthquake are likely to be similar to those he experienced in the Canterbury earthquakes. Uh, Mel lives in Timaru and would like to know if the earthquakes she has felt recently are related to the Canterbury earthquakes. And does Timaru have any known faults like Christchurch? And also, could Mount Horrible become active again? And lastly, from Maria in Rakaia, she asks, uh, in the maps of the Canterbury quakes, there is a big area that doesn't have any quakes. Why is that? Now, I thought I'd open this up to Rob and Caroline and Tom, perhaps. Uh, would you like to help us answer these questions? Sure, maybe I can start and then just to give a bit of uh, background from the seismology perspective. So that was the question on the uh, whether the recent Timuru earthquakes were related to aftershocks from the Canterbury sequence. Um, as a seismologist, I would say that the, the, the distance of those earthquakes and, um, and also the, comp the, uh, the comparison of the activity, the seismicity, the so the current seismicity compared to what the seismicity was prior to the earthquake would tell me that these are not related to um, the Canterbury earthquakes, that they are part of the uh, normal background seismicity for New Zealand. Um, now, in terms of the faults that these are occurring on, I'm going to uh, pass it on to Rob, our expert geologist um, today. <laughs> Thanks, Caroline. Yeah. Um, yeah, so um, the team that I work in is an earthquake geology team, and one of the things that we manage is the New Zealand Active Faults database, and it's an online resource that we have at GNS. Um, so I looked that up the other day, um, looked up, tried to find the area of Mount Horrible, and I found it. It's, um, it's fairly close to Timaru. There aren't any active faults right around Mount Horrible itself or near Timaru. Um, if you go a little bit further afield, there's, some, there's an active fault related to the Dalgetty Hills, and if you go a little bit further afield, there are active faults in the Waitaki Valley, um, kind of low activity faults in general. Um, it's not a part of the country I look at a lot. So that probably means that there isn't so many active faults in, uh, in the South Canterbury area. I want to pass on those other questions to the next person. <laughs> shall I do the liquefaction one, shall I? Liam, get yourself ready because I'm going to hand over to you at some point. <laughs> okay, so um, I'll start out by saying I'm not a liquefaction specialist, but from the, in terms of Eastern Christchurch, we know that the conditions there uh, make it really, really um, susceptible to liquefaction occurring during earthquakes. And so during the Canterbury earthquake sequence, um, there was a number of earthquakes which triggered liquefaction um, to varying extents and, and severities. Um, obviously the worst was with the, the Christchurch earthquake on the 22nd of February in 2011. Um, and when we're thinking about what might happen with the Alpine Fault, the, the level of shaking or the intensity of shaking that we expect in Eastern Christchurch will be much lower than what experienced with the Christchurch earthquake. But the key difference is that the duration of shaking will probably be much, much longer, probably in the order of minutes. So what that means is that those, those liquefiable soils, they, they sort of get charged and they can um, uh, eventually uh, lead to, to liquefaction occurring under those, uh, those conditions. So even though there's less shaking, um, the, the duration of shaking is longer, so it means liquefaction can occur. So the most recent studies that I'm aware of um, suggests that the extent and severity of the liquefaction will probably be lower than what we experienced in the Canterbury earthquake sequence during an alpine fault or immediately after an alpine fault earthquake. Um, but the, and some important difference, at, and that's from a sort of geological perspective or, or the physical mechanism, but we've also done some great things where we've got the red zone in place, which has pulled out a lot of development and infrastructure and, and people's homes from areas which are highly susceptible to liquefaction. So that will substantially reduce the potential impacts. And then as part of the SKIRT program, uh, or the big stronger Christchurch infrastructure rebuild, a lot of the horizontal infrastructure has been rebuilt with much stronger, more, or in many cases, much more ductile, um, materials that will hopefully withstand um, future liquefaction events much much more effectively. But I'm, I'm absolutely traipsing into areas that Liam is an expert in 
So I'll, I'll stop talking and hand over to him because he's, uh, he's definitely the guy that we need to be um, hearing from on this. Um, I actually don't think I could have said it any better myself. Um, I think, yeah, you've, you've done a good, a good, a good job at describing what we might affect. So we would expect that to be less and yeah, by, by moving away from the, the zones that we've seen liquefy over and over again, which in the red zone, you may see that liquefaction occur in that areas, but you're no longer affecting uh, property and people in the same way as you did in the past that you've taken a step back outwards. And because of the, the increase in the, um, the construction standards of infrastructure and also of residential houses to ensure um, that they are going to perform to a to a standard that was higher than what we'd expect um, prior to the, the Canterbury earthquake sequence. So, nothing more from me. Very very uh, succinct answer. <laughs> Tom, maybe you are. are oh, sorry. <laughs> I was just going to say, Tom, maybe you are a liquefaction expert and you don't know it. <laughs> I think everyone that lives in Christchurch is some sort of expert on earthquakes or, or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both for your answer. So um, a slightly different topic. We've had a couple of questions about buildings and um, earthquakes and tsunami. So Natasha would like to know one piece of advice you'd give to someone building a new home to make it more resilient to large earthquakes. Um, and Janet here has a question. Would um, she'd like to know if engineering can solutions can reduce the impacts of tsunami or if we need to build new developments elsewhere? So Liam and perhaps William, what are your top tips for someone building a new home to make it more resilient? And can engineering solutions help mitigate the impact of tsunami on buildings? Okay, I'll, I'll take the, the first one. Um, I think a lot of these tips have actually already been said earlier in the talk today. So um, if we think about the sort of buildings we, uh, residential buildings we have, they, they actually perform pretty well by themselves uh, during shaking. So we've got timber frame buildings, usually a lightweight roof. If you're just shaking those, they're usually gonna do pretty well. Uh, if you don't have a brick, brick chimney, that's usually a good thing. You're not probably gonna build a new house with a brick chimney. Uh, so that removes sort of one one hazard. Um, and we talked before about the, the fix and fasten. So it's really a lot of what you can do is related to what an engineer calls non-structural elements, which sounds very horrible, but it's all your bits and pieces that you have in the house that makes your house a home. Um, ensuring that those are secured because it's really them shifting around if they're not secured, that's what can cause a lot of the damage and a lot of the cost. So um, I'd say that's a big piece. and. Um, maybe the key thing is really a good foundation. So what's supporting, um, what's supporting uh, your, your building and depending on the sort of soil conditions, if you build a foundation that can deal with a little bit of shifting and movement around, then that can help to pr protect the, st the structure above from things like liquefaction. Um, and, uh, and you can, um, yeah, yeah that, that, would, that would be a really uh, key thing to, to apply for. And there's a lot of information on the EQC website about all those different aspects of what you can do for yourself. Um, I can pass the tsunami one on to William um, and maybe I can he can bounce back afterwards and see if there's anything else I want to say. Okay, um, so can we use engineering to make um, buildings safer from tsunamis and is that an alternative to not developing in tsunami prone areas? Uh, certainly engineering can be part of the mix. Uh, for residential buildings, I would personally say that the main thing is making sure that people can make a timely um, evacuation is the higher priority than building residential build, uh, buildings for tsunami safety. Um, it's very difficult to predict exactly how big or how strong a tsunami is going to be. So, you know, um, how do we know what level of um, engineering we would need to have a building that you would want to stay in during a tsunami, I think is a very difficult question. Um, for other kinds of infrastructure, I think it makes a lot of sense. So, you know, if you have a pipeline or a port or something that you really want to have operational quickly after a tsunami, I, I think it certainly makes a lot of sense to, to engineer it to, to be resilient. Um, but residential, for me, it's more about the evacuation, but um, Liam, can I ask your thoughts on that? 
Yeah, I totally agree with that. I think maybe in the residential side of things, a flexible lightweight frame, which is good for an earthquake, may not perform as well as, as a tsunami. But if you think about the balance of cost to invest, you're never going to try to build a residential house, uh, you know, a single story house. Um, it's much more about, as you said, understanding to try uh, to, to be able to evacuate. It's only really when you move to maybe multi-story, larger developments, apartment complexes, those sorts of things, which are usually more robust in terms of their design that, um, you know, we've seen evidence that uh, like a, a concrete reinforced concrete frame building, for example, can perform fairly well uh, in, a, in a tsunami and it allows you for a, uh, an ability to move up through that, that building to evacuate up outside of the, the depth range of that tsunami inundation. I just wanted to throw in a personal anecdote if I could. Is that right? Go for it, Rob. Yeah. Yeah. So um, uh, when the Kaikoura earthquake struck in 2016, I was actually asleep in this very room. Um, it was our bedroom, and on the side we had a we had a fireplace and a chimney uh, uh, attached to this room. And um, of course, the fireplace was actually damaged. And once I went in the field as part of the earthquake response teams, I noticed a lot of damaged chimneys um, in Marlborough related to shaking and ground damage um, along the fault systems. And so I was immediately aware that my, my house had a major hazard associated with it being that chimney. So in my time off in between response sessions, I was, um, I was manually taking that chimney down. And I think one thing I'd like to say is we're really lucky in New Zealand that we've got this thing called the Earthquake Commission that, that chips in and helps out with damage that occurs after earthquakes and and um, and is able to um, help fund and repair New Zealand buildings, houses. So, yeah. Great, thank you for sharing that, Rob. And I was <clears throat> you actually took the words out, out of my mouth. I was about to uh, remind people that there are some really great tips on the EQC website around but new building, building your house and preparing your house for earthquakes. And I recommend people check that out if they're interested in more information. Um, we've had a question from Owen asking what research there's been south of the Alpine Fault. Uh, so south of Fiordland. And I wondered, Kate Clark, could you tell us a bit about the research that's happened around the Persica Trench down there? Hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. Is it Persica? Persica, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know heaps about work going on in the Pusica, but I think in general the answer is there's not a lot of work going on down there, but there has been, there's bits and pieces going on at the moment and there's definitely been efforts in the past. Um, there's a few reasons for that. One is that it's quite remote and it's difficult to work down there because it's, um, you know, Southern Ocean and it's a tricky, expensive area to work. Um, the other relates to risk. There's just not as many people down there. So in terms of how we sort of allocate our research funding, um, it's not as high on the list um, of where we do research. Um, but yeah, as I said, there, there, are, there are bits and pieces going on. I think last month, GeoNet installed two new continuous GPS stations down in Fiordland um, to sort of increase the density of uh, monitoring um, the land deformation down there related to the Pusiga and Fiordland trenches. Um, there's somebody at GNS at the moment, Emily Warren-Smith, has a really dense um, seismic network out across the very southern end of the Alpine Fault to better understand the crustal structure down there. Um, I believe last year or the year before, there were some seismic surveys being undertaken mainly by a US group across parts of the Pusica Trench to sort of understand the evolution of that. Um, and of course, we have had several large earthquakes down there in the last decade or two. So um, after the Dusky Sound earthquake, I think that was 2009, there was quite a lot of efforts down there in terms of um, monitoring the area after that and recording what happened in that earthquake to better understand it. So yeah, there's, there's always bits and pieces going on. It's a really interesting area, but it's also a really difficult area to work in. Thanks, Kate. Um, so we've got a few preparedness related questions. So um, Jenna, Janice has asked, I have a survival cat, um, pack both at home and in the car. Is there any other places that she should have um, water stored? And Sarah has also asked how many days worth of food um, should she have at home? 
Um, and then we've also got a question from Paul and he'd like to know why emergency kits and plans aren't compulsory in New Zealand households. And Francis would like to know where the best place to find information is. So um, Car Caroline, there's quite a few questions there, but mm. do you want to maybe start with why aren't emergency kits and plans compulsory in New Zealand? Yeah, really good question. And I guess, of course, you know, we'd all love everyone to be fully prepared at home and at their workplace for any uh, disruptive events in future. But it's a very difficult thing to, to uh, make people do that. And there are various reasons why we shouldn't make people do that. Um, one of them being that uh, depending on people's personal resources, they may not have um, the money, for example, to spend on getting a, a whole lot of extra food in the cupboard, for example. Um, our, our public education agencies responsible for these sorts of messages about preparedness, EQC and uh, the National Emergency Management Agency and a few others, work really hard to try and get these public education messages out. Um, but it really comes down to a personal uh, motivation to get prepared. There are lots of resources out there for people who, who want to know more about getting prepared and how much of different things that you might want to try and store at your house or as, as the question asked around uh, workplace preparedness as well. And that's another really important thing. Um, I'm about to go next month with Alice actually over to the West Coast. And I always think about what I might need if we were stuck on a roadside somewhere on the West Coast and I would have a preparedness um, kit in the car with us, which would probably include a sleeping bag, extra food and water um, and any other uh, first aid and even an emergency location locator beacon. I've just been doing my health and safety forms, it's a bit boring. But these sorts of things could be really, really important if you get stuck on the road. So if you're the sort of person who travels a lot for work, uh, certainly having something uh, prepared in your car would be useful. And I guess the other thing with preparedness is that some things we can do are really cheap and easy to do, others are much more expensive. So we've heard people talking about um, remo removing chimneys, you can go to the extent of strapping your house to the foundations if they aren't already um, strapped down, which obviously helps to, to keep your, your house on, on its foundations during earthquake shaking. And then you can you can buy you know water supplies. You can buy a torch and first aid kit. We find that most people have done those easy, cheaper things to do. Fewer people have done the more expensive things in terms of getting prepared um, and mitigating some of those risks around their homes. So, you know, there's a huge spectrum of things you can do. Uh, people sometimes go all out and do lots of things. Some people choose not to do anything, and it might be simply because they lack the resources and the capacity to do those those preparations. Cool. Thanks, Caroline. And so there, um, Sarah asked like a, a, you know, a question around how many days worth of food um, should she have? So is that kind of more related to like what's within your abilities kind of thing? Mm. Yeah, I mean, if you if you have the resources, then, you know, I'd look at at least a, a minimum of three days of food. Um, that's the sort of the message that comes out from our, our national agencies around preparedness, three days of preparedness. My personal view is that if you can do it, try and become uh, more prepared in terms of a longer um, period for having food and water available to you. Um, but I guess the other thing to note is, and we've seen this in our recent experience of earthquake disasters, the community rallies around um, the neighbours, the, you know, um, the support comes along. So if you find yourself short of something, no doubt the neighbour across the road, you know, can help you or civil defence, um, they have their, um, you know, civil defence centres that pop up all over towns around New Zealand during these sorts of events. So um, whilst it's great to have your own resources available, if you are in need, there will be support um, out there. And, you know, there's the, we can't underestimate the, the importance of, of uh, people helping each other during these sorts of events. Thanks, Caroline. So I think um, if anyone is interested around um, getting a bit more prepared, then a really awesome website to check out is getready.govt.nz. Um, so I'm actually just going to hand over to Alice. So unfortunately, that is all the time we have for questions this evening. Thanks so much to everyone for sending them in. And thank you particularly extremely very much to all our experts for answering all these questions. We've really appreciated it. Um, for anyone who is interested in sharing this with a friend, you'll be able to watch this video tomorrow and we'll be sure to upload it to our YouTube channel so you can send a link to your friends that don't have Facebook. Um, we're going to try and answer the rest of the questions that we didn't get to this evening over the next few days.
Uh, but thank you all so much for coming and mā te wā.